Hi, Emily. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Where are you calling in from? Uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Just okay. Yeah. Are you an Oilers fan? Uh, yes. <laughs> there is a jersey hanging right on the other side of the screen, actually. <laughs> That's awesome. I actually, so I, well, I live in Colorado in Denver and they played the Edmonton Oilers in the playoffs. Was it last year or two years ago? Yeah. I don't know, whatever. And, but I was yeah. actually in Canada watching the game, not in Edmonton, but I was in Canada and I was like, this is so weird. Like being on this side of the country, like I felt like I had to like root for Canada, but you know, <laughs> it was hard. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard. I mean, I, you know, but yeah, so I, I respect, I respect Canadian fans though, because you guys are so passionate about hockey and I love hockey. So it's great. Yeah. We're a little bit diehard, whether our team is doing good or not, it doesn't matter. It's like, no, we're going to be there. So <laughs> is that where you're from? Yeah. I grew up just outside of Edmonton and then, yeah, it's kind of just like you cheer for where you're born and that's kind of what the deal is. So how is the weather there now? Is it still like pretty cold? Yeah, it actually is quite chilly. Um, we had beautiful weather. Like, I don't know where to be in Fahrenheit, but like plus 13, 14, which is like spring weather. Um, and then we got a dump of snow over a foot where I am and it's currently minus 28. So I don't know what that would be in Fahrenheit cold. It's, it's like five minutes outside and you get frostbite cold right now. So. <laughs> right. Okay. But that's your Celsius. So I'm like trying to think what that would, that's correct. So that would be, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to do, do my little conversion because <laughs> I never know. It's so hard. Okay. So minus 27 is minus 16 for you guys. Oh gosh. That's freezing. Yeah, a little chilly. The other night hit minus 40, uh, which is minus 40. So that's when it hits the even mark with you guys. Yeah. Oh my a cold. gosh. A cold. <laughs> I freak out when it's, well, I'm like when it's like 30 degrees here, which would be, I don't even know what Celsius, but that's, that's crazy. So good for you. Too cold. <laughs> it's too cold. Regardless, it's too cold. Yeah. <laughs> too cold. <laughs> so you have type one diabetes. I do. Yes. Okay. So tell us about your diagnosis story. Oh, it's a fun one. Um, I guess everyone's is a fun one. It's always like, it's always fun listening to other people's uh, diagnosis stories. So I was 25. I had, thinking back, I had all the symptoms. Like I lost 20 pounds in like two weeks, you know, major brain fog. I was eating like candy, sugar, like everything I could get my hands on. I was like drinking like two liters of ginger ale a day. That's like not what I would do ever, but I was going through a breakup and I was like, my body's stressed out. This is normal, right? Like you just kind of like write it off as normal. Um, and then we were actually at my family cabin, which was an hour out anywhere close to a hospital. And I started having stroke symptoms. So like my left side of my face went numb, my arms went numb, my vision went blurry. You know, I was like, something's wrong. So we rushed to the ER and did all the tests and whatever. And they're like, no, you're like, you're fine. Like this came back normal. But they're like, you didn't tell us you have diabetes. And I was like, I don't have diabetes. And they're like, your blood sugars are at a 29. And so what that is, 29 is 522 for you guys. So it's not crazy. I've heard people being like the 900s for you, but like high, right? So I was like, what? And so to me, I was like, that, that number didn't even register because I didn't know what it meant. And so, yeah, down the line. Um, unfortunately, I was diagnosed in 2020. And so it was at the height of COVID and I kind of just got like pushed out of the hospital, sent home, and we'll give you a call in a couple days with your A1C results. And so I got like no support. It was pretty sad. Actually, it was kind of scary. I had to call my like family doctor and be like, I think I'm supposed to be on insulin just from like Googling. <laughs> like that was just, yeah, because they couldn't give me insulin because they didn't have a confirmed A1C. And so for thinking back of like that's crazy they sent me home being in like the high 20s still but yeah so that's kind of what happened it was quite extreme it was a fun journey for the first couple months but i'm very different um i had a honeymoon stage for the first two years of my diabetes so like just recently i'm calling myself a full diabetic because i actually have to dose for like snacks now or before i can get away with like 15 grams with no spike so yeah it's been I'm relearning everything, which is annoying. I wish I would have just had it full fledged at the beginning. So I cannot believe that your story is crazy. I mean, yeah. even the stroke symptoms, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody having that. I mean, I've heard of people like puking and, you know, maybe even having like seizures, but I've never heard of that before. That's crazy. Yeah. And looking back at my blood work, like they didn't test. I have no idea if I was in DKA. Like I have absolutely no idea. There was no 
test done for that. And so I'm like, I must have been because thinking back, like I had all these symptoms for weeks, right? So, and oddly enough, so this was in November, I was diagnosed November, 2020. And in June, 2020, I had a fasting glucose on a random test of a 5.5. So somewhere within that range of September to November, like life just kind of decided to do a 360. So. So did you have COVID before being diagnosed? No, nothing. I had absolutely nothing. Um, or at least I was asymptomatic. I had not been sick at all. Um, so I heard that's a lot of things. People had COVID and it triggers the immune system. Um, again, I was going through a very, very stressful time in my life. Hindsight, I was also living at said family cabin and it's an older cabin. We've had basement floods. And so there is like environmental triggers, like there was mold, like that kind of stuff. Now thinking back, I'm like, that probably did not help the situation. <laughs> um, so yeah, there was some external triggers that were like, okay, this, this, this. But yeah, very, very interesting. It was, I haven't heard either of people having stroke symptoms with their like, <laughs> diagnosis story. So I feel special. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to guess you were in DKA. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think I don't so, know. Like, yeah. <laughs> just based just, on that story, I would think. Right, and the funniest thing too is I left and they're like, we need to go eat because we went, we went to the hospital at like 8 p.m. and we didn't get released until like 7. And I was hungry because I hadn't eaten for like more than 12 hours. And so what do we do? We go to Tim Hortons and get a bagel with cream cheese. And then they're like, call if you go back up. And so of course I spiked back up to a 29. And I'm like, what is happening? And so anyways, it was fun. It was very fun. <laughs> I can't believe the doctors also sent you home like that. I mean, I know not even yeah. any, any yeah. information. I was like, maybe just the next few days, eat low carb or anything. Like they just Nothing. like, just go home and eat. We'll give you a call. And then I was like, do my own research and doctor Googling. And I was like, um, I don't think I should be in the twenties for like, you know, seven days after this is crazy. So yeah. So in seven days from the hospital till you saw like an actual doctor? That was until I actually got into the internal medicine specialist at the hospital. Um, I made the executive call to call my doctor after two days. And I was like, hey, like this just happened. Um, and he's not, he's just a family doctor. And he's not legally allowed to tell me if I have diabetes. But he's like, you can't be sitting that high for that long. Like that's dangerous. So he gave me insulin to like get by until I actually saw the real doctor. And then he's like, oh yeah, you have diabetes. And I was like, no doubt. <laughs> like, thanks. So but even that is hard because it's like, okay, now you have insulin, but what do I do with the insulin? Like, how much do 100%. I? Hundred percent. Yeah, and I think um, as I talked to a lot of other diabetics, I don't know if you've seen this sliding scale where it's like, if you're at this, take this with no other carb counting exercise. So honestly, I don't know how I didn't like pass out in the first couple of weeks because I would like take four units of rapid and then go for a walk with no candy on me and not like I didn't even understand it right like now I'm just like that's so scary yeah whereas before I wasn't educated and I think the problem is is because it was at the height of COVID and so it was like get out of the hospital home is safer we'll deal with you there and I kind of just got I think forgotten about unfortunately but I'm still here so that's exciting you <laughs> so. made it through but that's so funny too because I even remember my first week I also didn't know what would bring my blood sugar up so I would just eat, eat like everything in sight and I didn't realize that some things would take a while to hit my blood right. sugar yeah. and so I would stay low for like hours and I'm like I don't understand it's just it's like, it's like yeah. disease. they just like yeah. don't you know it takes a while to learn yes. for sure yeah still learning every day <laughs> like yeah <laughs> So, okay. So how long has it been now that you've been with diabetes? Um, so I hit my three year in November. Okay. So yeah. how do you feel about it now? Do you feel like you understand? I feel good. Yeah. Um, I think it, the last couple months have been hard because again, I've had that major shift. Um, I'm definitely out of my honeymoon stage for the first, like almost year and a half. I was only taking two units of basil. Like that's it for a day for a whole day. I was taking two units and I would use maybe three or four units of rapid. The whole month like the whole month it was absolutely insane so now i've you know as i'm calling myself a real diabetic now um, that i actually have to like you know like oh i'm you know eating some protein five grams okay i need to make that into carbs right so that shift happened mid-summer so i'm still getting used to like you know i can't have my cheat snacks which is like cheese and apple right like that's not okay anymore so but it's easier because it's easier to know right before i was like kind of like yourself like is this gonna raise my sugar I don't know. So you're playing the catch up game all the time. Right. And now it's like, okay, I know that one. Let's take a unit and a half. Right. So 
but yeah. it's just it's all mindset and just like i've definitely learned you just gotta let go like i think for a while there i was getting so frustrated and just getting mad and being like like i'm doing this to myself like what is going on but then you're just like the next day's great right so you kind of have to like give and take and be yeah stressing over it's not going to help blood sugars either so yeah you're right it's not yeah. <laughs> So does anyone in your family have diabetes? My grandpa on my dad's side had type two, but that's, yeah, that's literally it. Um, and I was actually just involved in a study. I think it was University of Chicago and they are, they did like a saliva test and they're kind of looking at genes to see. So I'm hearing back if, if I come back with a certain one, they're going to ask my parents to submit saliva just to see if there's any, like, you know, those, you know, types in our family that's hiding, <laughs> but yeah, there's no one else that I know of. So I want my family to do the same. They're all too, I think, too nervous to like take the test to see if they have the gene. But I'm like, you should, because there might be ways to pre not prevent it, but prevent it for like, you know, a couple of yeah. years or whatever. Like, you yeah. should do it. Trust me. You yeah. don't want this disease, but. <laughs> if I could go back and be like, whoa. Um, actually, so funny enough with my diagnosis story, I forgot about this very vital part. I was got undiagnosed celiac for my whole life um, and did not know until a random blood work test that we did after my diabetes diagnosis they like do a whole bunch right and diabetes and celiac are very common because they're both autoimmune diseases and i tested positive for celiac and no one noticed until i went into my endos team and they were just looking at my chart like oh like you tested positive for celiac like did you get sent for a scope and i was like what and so looking back i've always had stomach problems i've always had crazy bloating after eating but i didn't really connect it because my brain growing up celiac wasn't a thing right dairy was but not celiac um and even my mom said as a kid like they thought i was lactose i was put on different like formulas and so i went in for the scope but i did have really severe stomach scarring and so they think that added inflammation in my body and the autoimmune condition helped trigger so my doctor's like he's not, i'm not saying it didn't but you know undiagnosed celiac could have contributed to triggering your type 1 diabetes and i was like well, that sucks <laughs> so <laughs> That's the like, worst too. Like you had to learn type one diabetes and now also start eating gluten free. Like that's a lot. Yes. So that was hard because again, that first couple, I guess it would have been six months, I wasn't celiac when I was diabetic. So I was eating, you know, the low um sourdough breads and like the keto breads that were gluten and being like, why am I still having these stomach problems? And then after finding out, and for anyone that is celiac, they know that a lot of the substitution foods that make it gluten free are higher carb. And they use different starches and stuff that spikes your blood sugar. So it was like relearning the process of like, okay, like these grains or lack of grains hit me differently. <laughs> so yeah, that was fun. It's just like the last three years have just been like, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> it's been a lot. I'm, I'm not celiac, but I have a very bad sensitivity where like inflammation wise, okay. where I like will break out in hives if I Ooh. eat gluten. So I understand it's, it's yes. so hard though. It like, I mean, both individually are hard, but then when you put them together, it's like, this is just unreal. <laughs> yeah. It's unreal. Yeah. So I, yeah, I eat a very whole foods based diet. Like I don't eat many pra like packaged things. A, it's expensive. Gluten-free stuff is so expensive. And so, yeah, it's just not, in my opinion, I'm like, you know what? I'll just eat fruits and vegetables and meat. That's good enough for me. Like, <laughs> well, that's a great transition into, okay. So you're a nutritionist, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, so in Canada, there's lots of different terms. And in the provinces of Canada, there's also different designation titles, depending on what province you're in. So in Alberta, I'm considered a certified holistic nutrition consultant. So the actual, the term nutritionist is um, protected under the Diet or dietitians act. So it's a different term. Yeah. Same same idea, it's just the legality has to be <laughs> clarified there. But yes, yeah, so we focus on snapshot difference of like a nutrition dietitian versus holistic nutritionist is like we do whole body. So we sleep, exercise, mental health, um, obviously food, um, like stress levels so hormones, whereas like that dietitian obviously is more diet based. Um, so we do more of a holistic approach where it's, you know, we look at everything and hence the stress levels and like sleep is important because it all goes hand in hand. Um, yeah, so we're a little bit more, you know, not just specialized, but whole body approach kind of thing. Did you get into that before being diagnosed with diabetes or after? after? Yeah, so before I have my marketing degree and I was looking for a way out and then this all happened and I kind of took it as a sign. I was like, you know what, like I wanted to go back to school for something um, health bonus related. I didn't want to go back because dietitian's like seven years. And I was like, I didn't want to go back to school for seven years. No way. And so I found this 
program for this other one, I was like, oh, like this is perfect. It was remote. So I didn't have to worry about like going in with public because it was during COVID still. And yeah, it was like perfect. So I kind of, I use my diabetes story as like a new door opening as like a realization, like my body was like, something needs to change. And then it led me down this new path. So it wasn't all bad. <laughs> so how long did this, like, is it a certification? Like how long did that take? It's a diploma program. So it was a two year program, but condensed into one. Um, and so it was very heavy. Yeah. We did like anatomy in two weeks, which was insane. Um, and going back to school after not being in school for eight years was quite the experience. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, but I love it. It's yeah, I don't ever re regret doing it and changing it. It's yeah, it's been honestly like it's so fulfilling. Just like helping people and just like simple things being like, do this. And it's like their whole life changes. So it's yeah, it's really cool to help. <laughs> Well, ever since being diagnosed, I feel the same way. I've learned so much because we have to having type one, you just learn things. And I'm like, I kind of want to go get like some type of certification or something because I find it so more interesting now than I ever did before because I have 100%. to. Because you can apply it to yourself, right? It's like, oh, like, this is happening to me. So yeah, I obviously, not that I obviously do, but I, I specialize in like blood sugar stability, like not just for diabetics. Like I think it's important no matter what like i'll use my dad as an example he doesn't eat all day and then eats a crazy heavy pasta meal for dinner and then feels like garbage i'm like yeah <laughs> right like like it just people don't realize though they think blood sugar they think oh diabetic i don't have to worry about that it's like well no like all of us all of us have it right it's just how you work with your own body but yeah especially being diabetic hopefully people know some people don't unfortunately so yeah like my boyfriend's dad for an example he's a type 2 but he rarely checks his blood sugars and so he often just you know do a random test once a month and he's at like a 22 which is like i think the 400s or 500s for you guys right and so it's like they just people don't sometimes don't care right because they don't feel it and it's like oh i feel fine it's like well your body probably doesn't feel fine <laughs> so yeah it's um i think type ones have a foot up on the type twos for that because we do have to be a bit more on top of it right where it's type two it's like Unfortunately, there's lifestyle and food related, and sometimes they're probably not the healthiest already going into it. Whereas type ones, you know, we kind of have to be a bit more on top of it with the insulin and all that fun stuff. So, right. We have to worry about it literally for every meal. Where literally they every second walking, doing things. Yeah. <laughs> Except, yeah, I hear stories like that for type twos too. And I'm always mind blown because I'm like, no, I feel, I feel bad for them. Like they almost need more help too. Like people like you that can like actually coach them because they don't get the help and then they just don't even realize what's happening. Yeah. And I think that's like, I just had a client, um, he was diagnosed type two and his doctor just said, eat less, like no guidance on what to eat, how to eat. Like it was just like eat less. And this guy is like six foot nine. He plays football and he's like, I need to eat. Like I'm feeling like I'm going to pass out because I'm fatigued. Right. And I'm like, I just, it's so frustrating, right? When people just like get sick, cause that's, that happens a lot. It's like, just, just don't eat sugar. It's like, well, we still need sugar. Like, right? Like, it's just like, so yeah, it's uh, the disconnect is mind boggling sometimes. And like, good luck. Sugar is literally yeah. in everything. Like, like, what would you eat? Nothing. A carrot, not even a carrot. You can't have their sugar and carrots, lettuce. Like, <laughs> so. I know. Yeah. There's. Crazy. That is definitely a problem, I would say, is the lack of education around diabetes and even just the separation of type one and type two. Nobody knows the difference. Absolutely and it's, it's challenging. Yeah, it is challenging. And like, I've actually gone into arguments with type two diabetics and then being like, oh, like, why are you looking at your sugar so much? I'm like, why are you not? Right? Like, it's like, it's such a disconnect. And they're, it, I think, like, the education really has all in a part and like as every diabetic has seen posts like sugar did not cause diabetes but like in the type twos it might have right so there's still that disconnect of like the type ones being like that didn't but the type twos could have so it's it's a weird yeah it's a very messy space i think that's very tangled and i don't know if it's ever going to change which is kind of sad but even for type two, so like I, I give them the benefit of the doubt because it's not like they ate they ate one donut and they got diabetes. It's a long, long time like coming. It can be genetic, it can be like hormonal. There's so many factors. I know, um, so I feel so bad because they get made fun of all the time, and I'm like, these poor people, like they need help. They don't need to be made fun of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's sad <laughs> and frustrating and sad. <laughs> So I'm curious in your opinion, are there any like food trends that are going about that like you disagree with? Yeah, actually I was just asked about one other day, the carnivore diet. 
I'm like, I've done diets. When I was diagnosed, I was put on the lectin free diet. I don't know, my doctor just said, do this diet. It's a low carb diet and it worked. I liked it. It, it. I felt good. But then again, it just didn't work for my body's needs after a while. And so I'm not anti diet, but like, I think it's so individual. And so like what works for you is not gonna work for me. What's not gonna work for like so-and-so, right? And so, yeah, I've had some people come forward because cardboard diet's the new thing now and plants are bad and just eat meat and, that's one that I'm not loving because it, it, it doesn't get the whole picture, right? Like you still need nutrients from other stuff. And so, yeah, it's so, it's so hard. It's so frustrating because people, I think, just like see it like working for someone else and they jump on the bandwagon of some influencer being like, do it like this. And then they do it and then they get sicker or feel worse, right? So I totally agree with you on the carnivore diet because, well, I'm like, let me start this way. I actually did it for a week okay. and I actually have never felt better doing it for that week. Yep. But the challenge here is there's no way I could maintain that. Exactly. So it's like, it's one of those things like, yes, I felt amazing. I felt lean. I felt thin. I felt just like healthy, but I was like, there's no way I can just keep eating it's meat longer. the rest yeah. of my life. Like I, I, I'm craving other things and my yeah. energy was dropping. I noticed that. And so it's like, mm -hmm. yes, it might make you feel good for the time being, but like, is it realistically going, like, can you do it the rest of your life? Probably not. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It's like the 75 hard challenge that's going on at I think the beginning of every year that happens. I and mean, it's the exact same thing, right? It's like, great, but what happens after those 75 days, right? Like the whole point of a diet shouldn't be like a diet plan. It should be like your diet is like what you take in environmental wise and stress and friendships and nutrition, right? So it's not just like eat potatoes and rice and carrots for every single meal or cabbage food diet, right? Like it's just, it's so much more and just like, I think thinking back, it's like the more important thing is just eating, like how it makes you feel better, right? Because if you restrict that food, so you're, let's say you're on a carnivore diet and like that popcorn in the fridge or fridge in this cupboard is staring you in the face, right? And then you give in and binge eat five bags, right? Like versus if you just like let yourself have a little bit of this and that, like you're way less restricted. And so that's the problem with those diets, like carnivore diet, it's like, you feel great and then your body's like i need food and then you just eat way more than you would have than just like keeping it even keel the whole time and just being aware of your food intake but yeah carnivore diet keto obviously with diabetes is obviously a big one all the time yeah but i i think it's so independent like some people can do it no problem and then other people they feel awful right so it's like you really gotta just like try it but don't get too sucked into the whole social media selling of it honestly it's a selling tactic it's marketing and just buy my pill that's marketed for keto and it's like please don't <laughs> that even makes me think i'm sure you know paul saladino mm -hmm. the carnivore guy but even he, i like him because he was full-blown carnivore and then he now has been like adding in fruit and other things because he even said the same thing he's like i'm too tired i need sugar and i need carbs and so while he still only eats meat and fruit it's like it's still at least he's proving that like maybe just straight meat is not the best yeah and again that's like it's so individualistic and depends on what you do right like if you're a person that sits at your desk all day and doesn't burn those calories it might work for you but if you're like in exercising and running and like doing all these things like you need to kind of get it from somewhere is it the meat eater documentary on netflix there's another one there's a couple different ones and i've watched all of them obviously but yeah it's so interesting to like some people are like it works for them and then other people it doesn't right so i think that's just like yeah he's a good example like he does the meat eater or carnivore diet, but he's aware that his body needs it. So he's okay with fluctuating out of the diet restriction. So I think that's like very vital. So for someone maybe that's like wanting maybe, you know, to start eating healthier, but they, there's so many obviously diets on the internet right now. You're like, what do I follow? Like, where do you yeah. recommend? Where do they start? I, I think like, I try to train people out of the word diet like I, I, again, I try to reform the word diet as like everything you're taking in. Right. And so I try to focus on like what makes you feel good and what makes you not feel good. Um, so, so usually with clients personally, like I like to make them, I tell them to eat what they eat. Like the first week of our thing, I don't change their diet. I'm like, eat what you eat, but record after each meal, how you feel. And if you're feeling sluggish, if you're feeling like you have headaches, like then we're like, okay, like those foods are not for you. Um, and so it helps them like, no one's going to be like, listening to a specific diet if i'm like stop eating carbs like no what it's not going to happen right so if you let people understand how that food's impacting them then you're way more likely to actually get them to adhere to listening to their body yeah i like honestly starting with just like going back to the basics like 
if it comes in a package, um, I actually just made an Instagram post about this yesterday. It's like, if it's trying to sell to you and market to you, it's probably not the best because it's trying to convince you to eat it, right? Um, it's like a friend, right? Or a boyfriend. If they're trying to convince you to be in a relationship, you're probably not really wanting to be there. You just be there already. And so like finding foods that like are like naturally based and then obviously, you know, chips and crackers, who cares? Like we're still human. We're going to eat them anyways, right? But like starting with those whole foods and then the extra stuff is extra. It's not like the base of your diet, but yeah, like just really paying attention to how you feel. And if that means, you know, using keto as a base diet, but adding on extra stuff, that's fine. But like making sure you're not restricted to the specific like rules of a diet is important. Before being diagnosed with type one, I don't think I ever once looked at like a label ever. I know. And I, my family, I grew up in like a packaged food family. Like we are okay. snackers. That's all we did. Yeah. And then after being diagnosed, I'm like almost upset that I did not know about this beforehand because I'm like, yeah. now I look at labels because also the gluten-free thing I have to, right. and it's disgusting. The type, the ingredients that are in food, packaged food. Yeah. And I'm like, holy crap, the world needs to know about this. Like, this is it's gross. It's crazy. And especially this stuff again, it's like, like the margarines and like that kind of stuff where it's like heart wise and it's like whoa right like if you actually like look into the research of these foods like you know like canola oil like all that stuff that's just like it's so awful it's in everything it's in everything because it's cheap um it's easy to produce it makes it shelf stable right so it's like yeah looking at in like that's a great point looking at like the ingredients is almost more important than looking at like the calorie i think that's a problem with with like the 90s you know people growing up the 90s it was just calories oh that's too many calories too many calories that'll make you fat but no one looked at the other stuff right so i think that's changing i think it is slowly but it's also not getting obsessed with it is important too right because you can get so nitty-gritty and be like oh that's too much sugar or oh that's can't eat that because it has whatever in it right so just like having a healthy understanding and balance is really important because you can spiral very quickly and just start being like counting your macros and then it just gets out of hand. So, yeah, but even now it's like, I look forward to finding good recipes I can make with whole foods yes. and not having to throw in, you know, just pretzels or like packaged food. And yeah. it's, it's, it's fun now. Cause I can throw in things and be like, Ooh, this tastes good. This doesn't or whatever. And it's, it's fun if you can try to make it fun I guess yeah fun and it's also I think just like more controlling right like just like granola you can go to the store and buy granola it's expensive or you can go buy the ingredients for granola make way more and control what you're putting into it and then it's like you're having fun you're learning how to cook you control what you're putting in your food and it's like it's a whole it's a different approach versus just going and buying a granola bar that has like you know 10 pounds of sugar in it versus the same tasting better food at home that's you know you made it but yeah package is hard and I think it's just because food is so expensive right now like it's really difficult to rationalize going and buying you know this and that i'm not a i like i like organic foods we'll segue into that really quickly for certain stuff um there's a fantastic list called the dirty dozen and clean 15 list that like i really try to like push on people because that's more so like the food that you really should eat organic where everything else is probably like it doesn't matter as much but that's a problem. It's like people think of eating healthy and they think I have to eat organic. Oh, I have to buy this, you know, this apple is $6 more than the non-organic one, right? Well, obviously I want to buy the one for $1, but like, it's just thinking about it as like, you know, what else are you spending that $6 on that you might not need to? Like, do you need those gushers down the candy aisle? Probably not, right? So it's just like making those switches and being okay with like, you know, that your health is going to cost a bit more. So maybe don't spend 800 bucks on that gym membership and maybe eat a little healthier that you'd never go to the gym. Right. So. Yeah. And it's, it's funny you bring that up. Cause a lot of people say that about, Oh, it's just eating healthy is too expensive, but mm -hmm. I'm like, it's actually not. If you only buy like produce, it's because you're also buying packaged food and it adds up really quickly. But if you have to cut one out for the other, it pretty much is the same. It is the same. Yeah. And like, I like to think of that too. It's like, you guys have Costco in the States, correct? Yeah, so like I went there yesterday um, and Slim Simply Protein Bars, my absolute favorite. I love them. I just put them in my purse. They're like seven grams of sugar, done, easy, good little snack. <laughs> oh, I know, obviously, the amounts. And like, but I can make them at home like so easily. So a box is like 19 bucks, where it's like if you look at, if you break it down, like you can make five times that if you just take the ingredients and make a sheet pan of it, right? And so it's just like making those little switches of like, using the pre-made stuff reforming it and it is cheaper in the long run right so it's just like there are ways to make it cheaper i think people are just also unfortunate sometimes a little bit lazy or don't know how to do it and so they rationalize eating healthy is expensive and hard 
where they just want to take the time to like really understand like what that means and healthy isn't just like a label right it just means like just being aware aware is healthy right so and it, it is hard i mean like you know it's it's a learning curve especially if you're used to just eating packaged food it it is hard but it's worth it, it, is worth <laughs> for, it. Sure. Yeah, for your bank account and your health it is worth it yeah absolutely so other than food, because you're a holistic nutritionist, what other things can we do other than food to like help our overall health? Sleep is huge, especially for blood sugar stability. So essentially, if you don't get enough sleep, your body's kind of in this like constant catch up cycle or you're eating too close to bed. There's lots of research right now when people are fighting on the internet of like, you know, eat till you go to sleep, it doesn't matter. Or does like eat four hours before. There's a whole thing. Again, do what your body feels good. If you wake up feeling sluggish, look at what you ate before bed right like that kind of stuff um so sleep is absolutely vital stress like we talked about so i literally just made an instagram post about that this morning like when you're stressed your body doesn't digest which doesn't absorb nutrients which kind of just like it's a waste of food and you poop it out that's kind of it right and so if you're eating if you're upset if you're crying like if you're just in like you're working and you're snacking while you're working and not paying attention like your body doesn't actually take in that food and so it's kind of scratch so yeah sleep stress Hydration is massively important because if we're dehydrated for blood sugar levels, that means that the imbalance of glucose um, and water in our bloodstream, but it's for like general mood stability, which then increases stress, which impacts sleep. So it's just like this vicious cycle of you just can't get out of it sometimes, right? So like diet's obviously important, but I think it's like, it's almost the last piece of the puzzle because you don't have those foundations of like sleep, stress and hydration first whatever you eat doesn't matter because you're not actually absorbing it right so yeah that's it's a a matrix of... <laughs> it's, it's a lot it's a lot it's sure. a lot yeah but i think that's i think that's what scares people too right because like, well, i can't do that like i can't fix my sleep and stress and drink more right but it's like pick that one goal like okay like just this week try to drink more water next week try to go to bed you know before 11 p.m don't look at your phone until you go to sleep like just you know give yourself some like so there's little baby steps you can do where i think a lot of people like joining these diets or these plans or these challenges it's like do this now right and then that's why you don't adhere to it because it's so much all at once and no one's gonna do that absolutely no one's gonna start you know who's how many people have signed up for the gym for a new year's resolution and gone every single day for the whole year less than one percent of the world right because it's so much all at once whereas if you're like i'm gonna set a goal to go twice a week and then you know in february three times a week and then in march four times a week right so it's like setting those small goals that are attainable so you feel good when you reach them and not bad when you don't and same thing with like health is like so important that's another benefit i think type ones have because we can see like because our cgms we can actually see what's happening if we don't get sleep it's like oh gosh oh. You know? or whatever like we do have that benefit which is yes. great yes. Yeah, that's actually, that's, I actually was talking about that with a friend the other day. I'm like, I can see what's happening, right? I'm like, oh, I'm getting sick because I'm riding higher and there's no reason for it, right? So I'm like, I'm going to be sick next week. And she's like, how do you know that? I'm like, trust me, I'm going to be sick next week. And usually it's right. So yeah, I guess it's a, it's a blessing. Sort it's, a weird, of. it's a weird blessing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, awesome. So how do people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about nutrition? Yeah. So my business is called Everyday Wellness with M. Because again, I focus on just that holistic everyday approach, right? It's not just, you know, one day. So yeah, Everyday Wellness with M and I'm on all the socials. That's my email address, my website, all the good stuff. Yeah. And I'm on every platform. I'm trying to be better at TikTok. I hate TikTok. It's so dumb, but I'm trying. I'm trying to be a TikToker. I'm mostly on Instagram though. That's kind of my, my comfort zone still. <laughs> yes, I am with you there. Yeah. <laughs> And do you help people all over the world? I do. Yeah. So I do have like um, a physical practice in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, but yeah, most of my clients are remote. So yeah, it's fun. Because I think that's what scares people too, is sometimes they're not comfortable going into a space, right? They're more comfortable in their home, right? Where it's like, and even computers, like most of my clients are phone call. We don't even do video because they just want to be comfortable in their own space. And that obviously is important <laughs> with my practice. So yeah, that's just kind of whatever anyone needs. Um, yeah, that's where I'm at. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. This was a great conversation. <laughs> thank you for having me. This was fun. <laughs>